What's up and welcome into this video where I'm going to be sharing with you the strategies for winning after the first move pawn to e4. I'm going to show you a couple interesting opening lines, but even more so, I like to give you general guidelines that you can follow in case you are unaware of a certain opening line or you forgot it, you can still follow these crucial strategies to win your games. All right, so the game starts with pawn to e4, pawn to e5. And let me even spend one moment to explain these first moves, because, you know, it's really good if you understand the reason behind the moves in contrast to just trying to memorize them, okay? So why is it that most chess games are started with a move pawn to e4? It is because the weakest uh, chain in the opponent's position, initially, is the pawn on f7, which is kind of a gate towards the black's king. We know that we want to checkmate the opponent's king and that f7 pawn is kind of the gate that allows you to do that. And then the next logical question is, how can you get your pieces to attack that f7 square? Which brings you to the idea of starting off with pawn to e4, because that enables your pieces to go forward and attack that square on the next moves. For example, if black goes pawn to e5, let's think about this for a second. How can white here attack the f7 square in the future? By the way, if you are an expert level player, then maybe you already know some of these ideas, but don't worry, I'll start from more basic stuff, and after that we'll gradually go to more advanced strategies, okay? So, how can you attack this pawn? The most straightforward way is to bring your queen forward, and from here it'll start putting pressure on, onto that pawn. Okay, one more way is to also use your bishop, which can also hit the f1 pawn from another uh, diagonal. One more way that you can use is to bring your knight forward to g5, and from there it'll also put pressure onto that pawn on f7. And finally you can push your f pawn forward, knowing that you're gonna castle in the future, and your rook is gonna be on the f file, and from here it'll put pressure across this f file towards the black's f7 weak square. But before it can happen, you need to open up the f file, and that is why the move pawn f4, even right here, is already a dangerous opening weapon known as King's Gambit. And uh, yeah, because the white's idea indeed is to open up the f file that you can use later on to attack the opponent's king. These were some general strategies, and now let's see how you can apply them practically. First and foremost, how about the move queen to h5? It's actually not as bad as a lot of players think. Even Nakamura used to play queen h5 frequently in, in Blitz games. Uh, first of all, the idea of this move is just like we already discussed before. You're gonna attack that f7 pawn and hopefully checkmate the opponent's king. Additionally, it attacks that pawn on e5, and it actually sometimes works if you're playing against a beginner level player. Sometimes they would wish to you know, push your queen away and just play pawn of g6. And in this case, this is a dream come true. You just capture the pawn and you attack simultaneously the king and the rook, thus winning the rook on the next move, and it's time for black to resign. Of course, black shouldn't play this move. Let's take one move back and see what else can black play. Uh, by the way, one of the shortest <laughs> checkmates in chess can happen if your opponent will play king to e7, and there goes queen takes e5 checkmate. Uh, of course, your opponent will unlikely play that badly, but anyway, it's just a cooperation. So after the move queen h5, the correct response for black is knight goes to c6 to protect that pawn on e5, and now white can continue that idea with bishop t to c4, aiming to checkmate on the next move with queen takes f7, known as color's mate. And sometimes, again, if you're playing against an inexperienced opponent, they will automatically play knight to f6, hoping to win your queen, but that overlooks queen takes f7 checkmate. Of course, if your opponent doesn't want to lose that quickly, they'll play pawn of g6 to cover this crucial diagonal, and after that you go queen to f3, renewing the threat of queen takes uh, f7 checkmate, and after that black can cover this line as well by playing knight to f6. And now the white's initial... A uh, hasty attack didn't work out, but the good thing for white is that it's still not all that bad. You didn't sacrifice anything, you didn't lose any material, you didn't weaken your position in any way, and you can just continue your development and keep playing as normal. So you, you gotta play knight to e2 to prevent black from jumping with his knight forward and attack you. That if black ever goes pawn to d6, trying to also disturb you 
with the bishop g4 move, you can just play pawn to h3 to stop that. And after that, you're gonna play usual development moves. After whatever black plays, you just play pawn to d3, knight to c3, and then you castle, and everything's good. You know, position is about equal, nothing wrong happened. And for Blitz games, you can even try out this line, you know, you can try to checkmate your opponent quickly. And uh, if you can do it, great. If not, you just keep playing as nothing happened. While Queen h5 is playable, definitely it is not the strongest move in the position, and I would recommend that you start off with bishop to c4, which still puts pressure onto the f7 square, but at the very same time you're developing a piece, therefore you're following general chess opening strategies, but also you're keeping it flexible. In the future you can choose which of the attacking ideas you're gonna execute, whether you're gonna you know, push the f pawn forward in a suitable moment and open the f file, or you're gonna move your knight forward to g5 to strengthen your attack, or maybe you will actually end up moving your queen to h5 in a suitable position and keep your attack that way. So you're playing the right move and you're keeping the flexibility. Now let's think what can black do next. Let's say they'll play knight f6, which is the most popular response for black, which also attacks your pawn e4, thus you protect it, knight goes to c3, and after that, if black continues their development in one or the other way, it doesn't really matter that much, let's say they go knight to c6, you can follow the same flexible strategy and play pawn to d3. Notice that instead of developing your knight to f3, keeping up the symmetry, you can postpone this development a little bit by playing pawn to d3 first, because once again, you reserve the opportunity of pushing your pawn to f4, if possible, because that will help you to expand on the king side. After that, black continues their development, let's say he plays bishop to b4, and uh, by the way, let me ask you, how would you play here as white? What do you think? You may think about this for a few seconds. Let's say it is your turn to play, which move comes to your mind first? In this position, it would probably be premature to play f4 right away, even though it is potentially part of the white's plan, and in some positions it can be really good for you to push your pawn to f4 and then continue with knight f3, castle, and if you can't do all that, that would give you a great attacking position. But the problem right now here is that by playing f4, white somewhat did not pay attention to the black smooth bishop to b4. And it's one of the really common mistakes when you're like just become too much occupied with your own intentions and you forget to pay attention to your opponent's moves and his plans. While in this position, bishop b4 clearly put it some pressure across your knight, it's also pinned the knight, and black were actually preparing to play pawn to d5 to crush your center, using the fact that the knight is pinned and you cannot capture that pawn with the knight. So after pawn to d5, white would have to recapture and black recaptures with the knight. Once again, notice that the white's knight is pinned, therefore black is not losing any material. And in fact, currently white is in trouble because this knight from d5 obviously attacks this knight on c3, the pawn on f4, the white's king became uh, somewhat vulnerable because he opened and adopted the position around it by pushing the pawn. So black already sees the initiative and white is somewhat in trouble. That's why it's really important while playing chess, you know, to pay attention to opponent's moves. I just took a few moves back to show you the position after the black's move bishop to b4. So if white were to stop for a second and think about the black's plan, white would realize that black is preparing that move pawn to d5 and would not overlook it. So that's just one of the general ideas in, in general about you know playing chess, not just about open games, but in general it could be really helpful, can really help you from any blunders. And if you want to go deeper into this subject, I would really recommend that you click the link on the screen or below the video and check out the course from Davorin Kuryashevich, a Croatian grandmaster who created this course about decision making in chess. And he's going over the games and a lot of games of amateur players as well, showing you what are the common errors of you know club level players in thinking and how do grandmasters handle similar situations so that you can make those adjustments in your thinking process and become a much better player. And also, once I saw a comment from one student comparing the style of this coach and grandmaster with the style of coaching from Kotov, the famous Russian coach, as well as mine, and so I thought that you may really love to uh, check out his coaching. So again, if you are interested, you can click the link below and check this out, and we are moving forward. 
In this position, it would be more prudent for white to play knight to e2 to support that other knight on c3 and once again keeping the flexibility of playing the f4 move anytime in the future. Let's say black castles, white castles, black goes pawn on d6, for example. You can just continue with bishop to g5, once again keeping it flexible. And in addition to the idea of pawn to f4, which is still there, and you're still gonna play it actually, but you also now have one more idea of jumping with your knight to d5 and taking advantage of that pin by pressurizing the black's knight on f6. So, uh, Certainly black may develop their pieces in some slightly other way, but your ideas remain more or less the same. As you can see, you are keeping this in mind that you're gonna expand on the king side and you're just playing some moves that help you do that in, in a suitable moment of time. Now let me show you one more line which could happen here. We just analyzed that after the first moves pawn to e4, pawn to e5 and bishop to c4, taking aim at the black's weakness, and pawn on f7, black usually replies knight to f6 and you go knight to c3. In this case, in addition to just some normal development of black species, they may also capture your pawn on e4. And this is the line that you should also be aware of, so that it does not shock you. Black is not sacrificing the knight. Their idea is that if you recapture, they play pawn on d5, getting the piece back, and at the same time uh, destroying your pawn center, so it gives black a pretty good game here. That's why instead of going into this line, there is something else that you can do. You can actually continue with queen to h5. Just like we discussed previously, it's good that you didn't develop your knight to f3 too early, and so you still have the opportunity to, to move your queen forward and put pressure on black. And in this case, the ideas are still the same. You're attacking both the f7 pawn as well as the e5 pawn. And in addition to that, of course, the black knight on e4 is still hanging. That's why the only normal move for black to keep up the material would be to go knight to d6, protecting the f7 pawn as well as attacking your bishop, so you need to retreat with the bishop. Now black goes knight to c6 to protect their e5 pawn from capturing, and in this position you can once again renew the threat to the black's f7 pawn. So you're kind of insisting on checkmating your opponent's king early, and you go knight to b5 trying to deflect this defender of the f1 pawn so that if you can seduce black into grabbing your knight, you will happily deliver the checkmate onto the f7 square. So you can see that all these ideas that we discussed at the beginning of this video on how you can combine, you know, the attack in open games uh, across these diagonals and checkmate the opponent's skins, they're really practical and not only against beginners, but they work against more experienced players in more complex positions just as well. Anyway, of course, black would normally play pawn on g6 to kick your queen away, and you play queen to f3, keeping in mind all the same ideas, so the queen keeps looking at the black's pawn on f7. And in this position, in the game that we are analyzing, black played pawn to f6, because, yeah, they realize that you are actually going to capture it, you're gonna grab the knight, and after that, capture the pawn on f7 with a checkmate. So they played pawn to f6. This position, can you find the right move for white here? There's actually a really interesting way for white to continue the attack and to break through the black's defense by sacrificing the knight on c7. This sacrifice deflects the black's queen from protection of the pawn and therefore after black captures, you can take queen takes f6 and you can see that white is pushing his plan relentlessly. White managed to break through and anyway got his queen around the black's king so that, you know, in some eventual future, white can actually de deliver some sort of checkmate. Which is, again, the, the really the core idea of white of quick victories in open games. But all right, right now bishop f7 is not possible because it's covered by the knight, but the real threat is queen takes h8, just grabbing the rook. And because this bishop is also attacking this diagonal, there is no way for the rook to escape. And so black decided to save the rook to sacrifice the bishop, white captured, and the rook went to f8. Now the rook is protected, and in this game white continued their attack by playing knight to f3. This just develops one more piece as well as potentially threatens the e5 pawn, but in general white is just gonna bring more pieces to his attack as you know, he can checkmate immediately, so he needs a little bit more uh, reserves to bring up reserves. White played pawn of b6, continuing their development. White played knight of g5, once again attacking potentially f7 square or maybe threatening knight takes h7 to attack the rook, etc. 
Black played bishop b7, hoping to escape with their king after alongside castling. And this is actually a little quiz for you. Please think about it and let me know in the comments down below how would you play here as white. It is obviously white to play. How would you play here? Please think about it. There is a winning continuation and it's interesting because there are actually a few options. So I'm curious to know how would you proceed here? So this short game just shows you how these general attacking strategies in open games will applied in real practical game and how you can apply all these ideas in your own games just as well. If you want to elaborate on this subject and learn more of similar strategies, then you can click the link on the screen or below the video and get the course about decision making. Right now is clearly the best time to get the course with all the discounts and bonuses and you can really dive much deeper into this because it's a 10 hour long course and you can learn much more than just from this little short video. I hope that you like this video and please hit the like button if you did like it and I'll talk to you soon in my next videos. Ciao!